If you wouldn't mind, uh, open up your Bibles to the book of Joshua, please. I'm pretty antsy. Not being here last week drive me crazy, but I, kn- I heard that this guy Theo came in and did a heck of a job, and I'm thankful for him. He's a great man of God. So let me just, uh, let me just we're going to start this series um, studying through the book of Joshua, and I just want to take a moment to kind of, well, more than a moment, but uh, take some time to, to kind of frame out the series so we kind of know where we are and where we're going. We, we've been studying through books of the Bible for years now and, and, and all, and so we know where God's taken us. We, we, now we need to figure out where God wants us right now, and then, of course, where we're going in the future. We get done with the last series, and so as, we, as a series is winding down, I always feel that pressure, like, where are we going next? You know, like, what do you want, God? What do you want? What do you want? So I start praying in that way trying to figure out what it is that God wants to teach me and wants to teach us and, 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 and move the kingdom moving forward and all that. And I'm trying to figure it all out. And I don't know about you, but this God is kind of a, he, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's weird a little bit sometimes, right? And, and, he, and he, do, he talks to people in different ways and, and, and at different times. And, and, and I, I, I agree with Paul when he's in, 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 in Romans, he's like, who can even understand the thoughts of this God? And, and, and he's the guy who's explaining them in the book, you know? And so I'm like that too. So like, don't judge me, but the time that I'm, I'm, I'm closest to God is when I'm in the shower, right? That's my time when, when I'm in the shower, I'm, it, it, we're tuning in, right? I, and, and some of us are in a car, and some of us are in an actual prayer closet. Some of us uh, are at work. Some of us are riding on a bulldozer, whatever it is that you're doing, but you, you get that time that you're intimate with God. My time's in the shower. And I had a lot of different ideas about where we should go next, you know, and I had a couple of different books. I was thinking about Ecclesiastes, and I was thinking about Ephesians, and I was thinking about Philippians, and then I was thinking about Exodus, and, and I was thinking about Joshua, and I'm trying to figure out, like, God, what, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? And so one day, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was in the shower, and, 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 I, and I just, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, just like, wham, you know, and, I, and something came to me. And, and I know that all of you are Bible st- scholars, and you probably already all know this, but I never remember anybody teaching me this, and I didn't remember them telling me this at seminary, but I was sitting in the shower, and all of a sudden it dawned on me that the name Joshua and Jesus' Hebrew name, Yeshua, were very similar in sound. And I'm like, huh, that's kind of interesting. I don't know if there's anything to that, but I just, I think that that's pretty interesting. And I just spent a lot of time spent, uh, talking to you about how all the scriptures point to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The church was started by Jesus. The church is added to by Jesus. The church is, 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 is all his. It's pastored by him. It's protected. It's provided for. It's all about Jesus. And so I'm thinking, man, is that, that sounds kind of similar. I wonder. And so I get out of the shower, and, and I didn't fall this time, which was an improvement. And I go over to the concordance, and I'm looking things up. And all of a sudden, I realize that it's true. That, that, that Joshua and, and Jesus have the same name. And, and, and Yeshua means salvation. It means deliverer, right? And, and, and that's who Jesus is. And so as we read through the, the Old Testament book of Joshua, still it's just oozing Jesus Christ, right? So it's a valid book today to study, to, to find Jesus, and to, 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 to identify who we are in Christ and find out who we're supposed to be and where we're supposed to go. It's all in there. And so I started reading through the book of Joshua. That kind of clinched it that day for what book we were going to study. We're going to study Joshua. And it's funny, the, the, the book of Joshua is, is, is an amazing book, uh, but, but uh, Joshua, uh, well, let's go back. Moses came before him, right? Yeah. Moses came before him, and, and the law came through Moses. And Moses brought the Ten Commandments and all to the people of Israel. And it was kind of cool because for a time, the law was it, it, like our, a, school, a school teacher, if you will, like a babysitter. It was a in the meantime kind of a thing. But, but there, was something, there was something coming down the pike. And, and, and the Bible talks about the law, that it was a schoolmaster for a time. But, 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 and it came through Moses. But, but what the law can't do, the deliverer, the deliverer can do. Right? And see, they never, Moses never got to the promised land. 
You know, he, he was this great leader of the Jewish people, but he never got to the promised land. But you know what, G, you know what God used to get people to the promised land was a deliverer, and that deliverer still lives today, and you and I all need him to get to our promised land. His name is Jesus. Okay, and so that's why we're going to study through this. You know, the book of Romans in, in the third chapter, verse 20, it says, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Funny, we think that it's going to make us right. You hear that all the time, right? You're going to heaven, you're a Christian, you, you believe in God. Oh, I'm a good person. I do good things. Well, whoop de do for you, right? You want a cookie or something. It says right here that, that doing right is never going to get you right with God. As a matter of fact, it simply, it goes on to say that it simply shows us how sinful we really are. How sinful we really are. And so, so this whole mindset that, that keeping laws and being good and stuff, it just, it won't get it done. It will never get it done. As a matter of fact, that's all it really does is add a lot of pressure to you and, and it gives you a lot of feeling of, of grief and disappointment and guilt because you can't be good enough. And then sometimes it gets even worse because you start feeling like you are doing good enough and it slips off into what? Pride. Look at me. I'm good. And a lot of people do that. Look at me. Look what I do. Look how good I am. Look how much I give. Look how much I serve. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And so it slides off into pride. The Bible is not a book of rules to just keep so that somehow God will love us, but the Bible is a book of rules that helps us realize how wrong we are and how badly we need a deliverer. That's what the Bible is. And the Bible, which we cherish, you guys cherish your Bible? Hold your Bible up in there, man. It's beautiful, isn't it? Who loves their Bible? I love my Bible. I love my Bible. The Bible is filled with Jesus' words, and he said to religious people that did want something, they had this, this angst inside of them to, to, for the transcendent, they wanted it, but he said all of it, no matter what you read, it's not a book of rules that you have to keep to make me happy, it's a book of rules that points you to me. The whole book is about stuff that points to him. That's what the Bible's all about. When you read the scriptures and you see of his powerful deeds, what does this make you say? I need him. Say that. I need him. I point it up. I want to hear it loud and clear. I need him. When I look at his rules and I can't keep from breaking them, what happens? Come on now. I need him. When I look and I know that he's going to judge, when I look at his amazing provision in all things, when I look at the lack of worldly justice, we've seen it all. What else? Need we need him. him. When, we see a, when we need a healing, we see his amazing healing power. When we lack wisdom. Right. Him. And so whatever we read in the scripture, it leads us to need him. All scripture points to Jesus Christ. But here's your part. You need him, right? We all need him. But... This is what the whole thing's about in Joshua. We have to choose. You have to choose. Don't get all Calvinist on me now. You have to choose to follow and obey. You might say, I need him, but you choose not to follow him. So you could say, I need him, but you still have to walk in his ways. Okay, so we, we need to choose. All scripture tells us, it says, this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is what I promise. This is what I want for you. This is what I want of you. You choose. You choose. Uh, the internet is, is kind of a freaky place. But if you go on the internet, they pretty much agree on this, that the typical adult male in the United States of America, this is a crazy number, they make 35,000 choices a day. That's a lot, right? 35,000 choices a day. A day. What do I wear? So now I, but let's just get even more specific. I, I decided on these shoes. Some of you might think it's a bad choice and you have the right to be wrong. But then I have to decide which shoe I'm going to put on first. And then wait a minute, do these socks match? Of course not. <laughs> right? 
But then I got to decide which one to put on first, and I got to decide every, every single thing, the next word, which way we're going to go to work. I'm going to say hello to you. I'm not. What I'm going to wear. How I'm going to do my... Well, never mind. All, anything. We have so many choices. I mean, you're going down the highway. You choose to look at this. You choose to look at that. You choose to go this way. You choose to go that way. We have different routes to get to work. And, I mean, all these different choices all day long. And so we have to realize that, that with 35,000 choices we make every single day, that today, that the moment you're sitting in right now is a direct result of the choices you've made up to this point. Now, now there are some things that influence your life outside of your choices. If I make a choice to go up and kick you in the shin right now, that was not your choice. And I understand that Andy would beat me up if I did that, so I, trying to be intelligent, will choose not to. He might go ninja on me. But I have to make a choice, but I could make a choice that affects her that she didn't have anything to do with. But by and large, by and large, I think you'll agree that you affect you more than anything or anyone else in this world. Would you agree? Yeah, we do. If you choose to go drink a ton right now, would it be a big surprise to you if you got arrested? Would it be a big surprise to you if you drank like a fish right now, if you were broke or divorced or you hurt someone or hurt yourself? Would it, if you made the choice to go get drunk, would any of those things surprise you? No. If you also chose to do something wise, maybe you decided to go to, to school and study hard and make it a priority? Would it surprise you based on that choice that you graduate, that you got good grades, or that you might even have a good job when you got done? Would it surprise you? Because everything that you are today is a product of the choices you made before. Do me a favor and go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. It should hopefully be up on the screen behind me, the page number for the orange and yellow Bibles that are around you. And if you don't have a Bible, you can go ahead and grab one of those. And if you don't own a Bible, take it home with you. It's our gift to you. Chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. It's all about choices. Here we go. God speaking. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses, now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, and I love that. You can almost feel God's heart, right, begging you. Oh, that you would choose life. Like it's important to him that you would choose him. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. See, what you do does affect other people. You can make this choice. Here's the choice. This is what it looks like to choose life. You make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. Now, I love this next line. It's short, but it's huge. What I just read to you right there, if you're looking for the meaning of life, the most important thing of your life, the most important choice you could ever make, those things right there. Love the Lord your God with everything. Obey Him and commit yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. That's it. That's the key to your life. You're looking, for, you're looking for, for prosperity. You're looking for peace. You're looking for joy. You're looking for purpose. You're looking for fulfillment. You're looking for forever. That's the key. That's it right there. It's right there laid out for you. Now, that brings us to our theme for the whole series of Joshua. All about choices. It's funny because it comes at the very end of the book rather than at the beginning of the book. It would make sense if it was at the beginning of the book, right? Set the stage and then we talk about it. That's what we do in today's world. You talk about what you're going to talk about, you talk about it, then you tell them what you just talked about. But it's not like that here in Joshua. See, in Joshua, the theme for the whole book is found at the very end. Go to Joshua 24. Joshua 24, 14 through 15. And this comes at the very end of his great adventure we're going to go through with Joshua and the Israelites. This is what he says, verses 14 and 15. And, and, and the, the, the first part of the, of the verse is not our focus. It's the second part of verse 14 where he says, serve the Lord alone. See, that's, there's, how much wiggle room is there? Is there in there for, 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 for worshiping and serving other people, other things, other gods? How much wiggle room? Show me how much. 
None, right? Serve the Lord alone, but, and he knows that people aren't always going to say yes to that. He says, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, I'm going to throw this in there, alone, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the God, now you can throw whatever God you want in here, but he says at that time, this is who they were, this, this was their options. He said, would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or, or will it be the God of the Amorite, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? And then Joshua takes a stand and every, every man in this room should stand with Joshua right here for your family. And, say, and Joshua says, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That's it. There's no option. That's where he stands. And all of us, whether we're men, women, or children, we all have to do what? Make a choice. We have to make a choice. Now, there's all kinds of stuff wrapped up in choices, but two big things is there's some theology in a, in a choice, and then there's blessing wrapped up in a choice. And what I mean by that is when we choose to do certain things, the theology of it is that God set it up where if you do certain things, it brings glory to him. People look at him more. His reputation increases. His popularity increases. People love him more. People serve him more, right? So there's that when we, when we decide to do something. But there's also some blessing in there for you. He says, if you will bring me glory, I will bring you good. So that's for you. Glory to God, good to me. And so my question to you is, are you ready to glorify God and bring good into your life? If you're ready, I want to hear you say, I am ready. I am ready. That is a sweet sound. Go to the first chapter of Joshua. Let's start reading. Kelly, a few weeks ago, ended... This is kind of funny to say this, but he ended Moses' life. That doesn't mean he killed me. He ended Moses' life in his, his message, which leads us into Joshua's, well, he's already alive, but this is his spotlight's on him a little bit now. So let's look at Joshua chapter 1. We'll read the first five verses. You all ready? All right, let's be led by the Lord. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever, I'm sorry, wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you, from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you nor abandon you. Now, the, the most famous section of that reading, of course, is, the fa is, is this whole thing about me not leaving or abandoning. You know, you've heard it a million times. I will not leave you nor forsake you. That's good theology. We don't want to jump over that. What that tells us is that that's a God who didn't create everything and say, okay, spin. You never see someone with a basketball, you know, spin the earth and spin the, the universe. And he got it going and then he put it on a, on a thing like they do with plates and then he went over here. And so right, that's your deal now. He's not that kind of God that created everything and then left. He's not that kind of God that saved you and left you to your own. He's the kind of God who's always with you. He is always with the believer. He's right there with you. Guess where? Right here. He's in you. He's right here. Yeah, right here. Okay, he, he, that's good theology. But, but, let's put you in the story. Can we put you in the story? Let's put you in the story so that it's very relevant to you. I got to ask you some questions. Have you ever felt called to do something out of the norm? Have you ever been thrown into something very difficult that you didn't choose? <laughs> a new job, perhaps? <laughs> A, a job that, 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 that you were sitting there at work and you're grumbling and complaining like a little Hebrew and, 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 and you're like, I could do that job better than him and then the dude quits or gets fired and they promote you and you're like, you know, or, or maybe you didn't know anything about it, but like Joshua, he, God says, hey, it's your, it's your job now and he probably wasn't, it probably wasn't even on his radar 
And all of a sudden you get appointed to something. You're like, oh my goodness, like I can't do that. Everyone ever been there? Anyone ever been a product of a divorce or a death and all of a sudden you're single? Boom. Ever been a part of a divorce or a death and all of a sudden you're a single mom or a single dad and you're like, oy vey, I got to do this alone. How am I going to work and make money and change diapers and daycare and feed and change duty diapers and all this stuff that, like, how, you know, mom's like, how can I work like daddy did? And dad's like, how can I change diapers and, and take care and love and nurture and, and, and how can I do this? Have you ever been called to a new level of righteousness, uh, perhaps like a, a, a call to sexual purity where, where, you, where you haven't found and, and, and chosen that special one, but you decide to just be with anyone? Have, have you ever been called to a, a biblical, uh, a higher level of generosity in your local context or a greater level of service in your local context? Have you ever felt that before? Sometimes it's just life kind of coming at us. Sometimes, uh, like I chose to kick her in the shin, she has to respond. Sometimes God brings something into your life. Sometimes it's the word of God that you're reading it and it brings massive conviction to you. And what do you have to do at that very moment? It starts with a C, it ends with an E. You have to choose. You have to choose. Sometimes the, the choice looks kind of like this. Like, Mountain. Me. <laughs> right? You ever been there before? Yeah. yeah. Joshua, no doubt. Don't tell me this is an old book that doesn't, that doesn't help us today. That, that, that is exactly what Joshua was feeling. Look, look at this now. Look what he says, right? He's... <laughs> This, this is just me, right? This, there's the Bible. Here's me now, okay? I'm not, this is not the gospel. Joshua is the son of none. What does that mean? You ain't nothing. You're nothing special. You're, your dad is not President Bush, okay? And you're not Jeb, and you're not W, and you don't come with this big reputation and all these resources, and people automatically just bowing down before you because of who your daddy was. You're not rich. You don't have this pedigree. You're the son. I got to do over here, right? That's not the Bible. You're the son of none. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think God is very, very smart, and he lets us know that this guy was nothing special, it also says that he was Moses' assistant. How many people right now know Bill Gates? I mean, not know him, but know of him. Raise your hand. Most of you know who Bill Gates is, right? Okay, so keep your hands up if you know his assistant. How many people know our president, Mr. Barack Obama? You know who he is, right? How many people know his secretary? Huh. <laughs> Yeah, you think he's a tough president. You think, well, I'm not going to say anything, but a lot of people don't like him, right? You think he's a bad president? Stick a secretary in there and see if she decides or he decides what to bomb and what not. Like, I wouldn't want that job. I'm just saying, you can rip all you want on the guy. I wouldn't want to be the president. With my finger on a red button, heck no. That's not for me. But he also, so, so he's, he's almost like he's, like God's actually building Joshua's mountain in front of him going, yeah, I need you to do this, and by the way, you ain't nothing. And so then he goes, he does this other thing too, right? This is, this is, this is I, I, wanna, I don't want to call God Captain Obvious, so just forgive me, Father. But he goes, he goes uh, Joshua, look, look here in, in the text, he says, therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, comma, the Israelites. No, duh. <laughs> really? Who do you think he was talking about? Like, do you think Joshua needed to know? There was two million people standing right behind him. They're the nation of Israel. Who do you think that he was talking about? I think it's time for you to lead the Hittite. No, of course it's these guys. But why did he do that? Because God's dumb? Because he's Captain Obvious? Or was it to remind Joshua and to remind you that these are a people that are stubborn and rebellious and will not be led? 
How about that it's the per- that now this guy's got a reputation to live up to. He's got to deal with all that they saw with Moses. He's like, you're throwing me into this job. You didn't ask me to fill out an application. You didn't ask for a resume. You said, you're going to do this. By the way, it's all the people that watched the Red Sea open, the manna come down from heaven. They've seen all my miracles, and you're it. Go to work. See ya. <laughs> How would you like that one? You think you got it tough. He was building Joshua's mountain right before his eyes. Why? The same thing you guys were saying before. Joshua was saying what? I need him. I need him. And that's why he chose Joshua. And that's exactly why he told him this. You're nothing. You need me. And I'll be with you. I'll be with you. So did Joshua, and I, we've, all been, we've all admitted that we've, we've had stuff happen to us. We've been called to do some crazy things. And we didn't want to do it. And Joshua's being called now. Do you think Joshua feared? I think it's reasonable. It doesn't say, but I think it's reasonable to believe that Joshua had some fear. He's got a cry. If you look in the text, it says that the Jordan River during that time of year was flooding. Like mad rushing river. This was no crick. That was a redneck thing for you guys. I did that for you. It's a creek. Come on, Chris. It's a crick, right? Is it hillbilly? Get me right. Is it good old boy? Get me something. Nothing here? Who says crick? Where are you from? Where? Ohio. That's so not down south. Okay. I'll never try humor again. So did, did Joshua fear, you think? Did Joshua doubt? Did Joshua worry? Did Joshua wonder, am I going to sink? Am I going to swim? Literally, he's got a river that's rushing over the banks right in front of him, and God wants him to cross over it. How is this thing going to play out? Anybody in this story yet? Raise your hand if you're in that story. Come on now. Anyone ever been there? Where you don't know how things are going to turn out? Anyone? So, so, so we go through life encountering these, these mountains, and so what do we do? So the Bible tells us what we're supposed to do. Look at verse 6. Let's read on. God says, you have a mountain before you. You're the son of none. You don't have any resources of yourself, but I want you to go do something that seems insurmountable. Verse 6. Be strong and courageous, For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land. I swore to your ancestors I would give them. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm reading this next verse, and I'm still going, yeah, that's still not going to cut it for me. If I'm Joshua, I'm still kind of freaking out, right? Okay, great. I understand, but but I can't, what am I supposed to do here? Well, well, we, we can choose right then and there. We encounter a mountain. And he says, I want you to be strong and courageous. So we have to choose at that point to be strong and courageous. But we don't want to just say that. We want to understand what that means. What is God telling him? Well, strong means to be able to withstand great force or pressure. Like this, force or pressure coming down on you, right? It's a wartime posture that God says you have to take on. And then he goes on to say, no, not only that, I want you to stand firm and I want you to hold, to hold up under the pressure, but he also says, I want you to be create, uh, courageous. Now, does, does that mean that you're fearless? Does that mean charge the gates of hell, man? Bring it on, I'm Rambo. Is that what it means? No, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, it means not deterred by danger or pain. So what it's saying is that the person is being called to notice that there's danger, to notice that there is pain, but persevere anyway, to go forward anyway, even though you know it's going to hurt, even though you know there's some danger, you might die, I go forward anyway. So you acknowledge the danger, you acknowledge your fear, and you acknowledge your worry, but you press forward anyway. If you're going to scale a mountain that makes you feel very, very small, you're going to need to take on this wartime posture. I'm concerned. I'm scared. But I choose to press on. Why can I choose to press on? You've got to ask yourself that. Why can I choose to press on? Is it because I'm awesome? Is it because I have great resources at my, at my disposal? Is it because I'm good looking? Is it because I'm popular? Or is it because I'm the son of none? I'm nothing. 
See, it's not because of myself that I can press on in the face of a mountain, in the face of adversity and pain and danger. Actually, I can choose because why? Verse 9, look what it says. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. And here's why. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's why you can choose to go on. Like, I've said this before, I'll keep saying it again. If you're going to a fight and you got Andre the Giant or Hulk Hogan or Joey, <laughs> or Joe, you know what I'm saying? I'm feeling real good if I go into a beef and I got Parview with me. I'll take on pretty much anyone in this room if I got him. Yeah, but if I got Tara, probably not. I mean, I'm happy that you're back, but I'm not going into a beef with her. Maybe if it was just me against her, but not if she was by my side. I want a big, bad dude that conquers and opens Red Seas by my side. And he says, listen, you can move forward. Even though you look at the Jordan River, you're like, man, I can't cross that. Look at that army. They're going to kick my butt. I can do it anyway. I know this danger. I know it's going to hurt. But you're with me, and I can go conquer. I can go. Does this mean I can go full throttle? at any and all things with reckless abandon. This is where the bad theology of I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me comes in. See, that's, there's bad theology in this because people think that I can just do whatever I want because Christ will strengthen me. No, that's not right. I don't, I, like, I know some of you in here know Jesus better than I. But I don't think that you can stand in front of a Greyhound bus that's going 90 and go through it, or it goes through you, and you don't turn into a pancake. And I stand before that bus and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Bam. That's not the way it works. See, there's a context to that lesson where Paul's like, you know what, when I have a lot, I'm good. When I have a little, I'm good. Whether I have a full belly, or I'm starving, or I'm living in a palace, or I'm living in a tent, I'm good. I can do this good, content thing because Christ strengthens me. He's all I need. See, that's the proper theology. That, that, that doesn't apply here. It's not like, oh, I'm saved. I get the Holy Ghost inside of me. He lives in me. Of course he's with me. I can do all things through Christ. Say that ain't right. That's not right. See, that's not right. See, you might be able to charge a mountain and conquer that mountain, that one mountain, because you're nuts and you go and go like, like Braveheart. <laughs> But that's not all that God wants, you see. See, what, that, that's just one mountain, but if we're going to tell the truth, and I think we're all in favor of truth in church, right? If you're in favor of truth in church, right? I'd say that lots of us have lots of mountains, don't we? Yeah, that's a yes. Yeah, we got lots of mountains, don't we? So, so let's look, let's, let's do this. Look at, the last, look at the last sentence of verse 8. Let it speak to your many mountains. Only then, I'll tell you what the only end then is. We're going to go back, but let's just see what it says. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. All your mountains, right? Not just one mountain, not the crazy wartime guy who rushes the hill and conquers the mountain and loses the war. He says that there's something you can do that you will prosper and succeed in all of your mountains. In all of your mountains. Prosper and succeed in all that you do. Biblical prosperity, despite what a lot of churches may teach, and you, you go on TV and you can see what they teach about prosperity, but it isn't cultural prosperity that just says, lots of cash and lots of stuff. Look at my hot girlfriend and my big car. You won't see this in your Bible because unless you're reading a New American Standard, I don't like the way the New, the, uh, New Living Translation translates uh, 3 John verse, three, verse 2. But this is biblical prosperity. Biblical prosperity in 3 John echoes what you just heard about prospering and succeeding in all you do. John, the Apostle John says, Beloved, and you know who he's talking to when he says beloved? You, the church, the people, the believers, the Christians. Beloved. So he says, Revolution Church, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. You see, so he says, prosperity is in all respects, 
just as your soul prospers. So it should mirror what's happened in your soul when you came to Christ. Let me give you some information here to take with you. This is good stuff, okay? When you came to Christ, if you came to, if you came to Christ, and I pray that you do before the night is over if you haven't, I beg you, please do it. Okay? If you've come to Christ, you came with a bankrupt soul. You were a dead man walking. You were a dead woman walking. And when he put his, his spirit in you, he gave you new life. Your soul at that point became 100% fixed. Now the process of becoming more and more like Jesus as he purges out your junk and he puts in his righteousness and his perfection, that's a process. But at that moment that you bent your knee to Jesus, he put his spirit inside of you and your soul was completely prospered at that moment. And so what he's saying here is prosperity covers all facets of life in the same way that your soul was completely healed at that moment of conversion. He wants every area of your life completely healed as you go along. That's biblical prosperity. What he's saying is that he doesn't want you to, as a Christian to have a healthy marriage but have completely jacked up finances. He doesn't want you to have really good finances and have a jacked up parenting situation with kids that are a mess and a house that's completely out of order. He doesn't want you to have wonderful vocation, but your theology is crooked. He doesn't want you to have awesome theology. I know about God, but my life is a train wreck. Every single void that's in your life should be filled with the Spirit of God so that you across the board have prosperity in every single part of your life. It's the Hebrew idea, and you've heard the word before, it's shalom. It's shalom. Shalom, 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 shalom. It's the idea of wholeness. It's the idea of someone being sound, of a sound mind. Like not good in some things, but totally cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and other things. It's, a, it's like a, if, you, if you've watched horse racing in any way, if a horse is not sound, that just means that they're completely healthy, but they might have one leg that's kind of sore. They're not sound. They're not complete. They're not whole. The idea of shalom is across the board in every area of your life, prosperity and success. And that doesn't mean I'm going to be filthy rich like Donald Trump. That just means I got enough here, my family relationships are good here, my vocation is going well here, my finances are good here, my relationships are good here, my church life is going well here, my theology is going well here, everything is going pretty good. Everything's good. Everything's good. Only then will you prosper. See, I want that. If you want that life, just tell God I want that life. I want that life. I want that life. I don't want to be all jacked up and, 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 and messed up half the time. I've got one area that's good, like, like uh, the, the church thing's going good, but my wife hates me. And, 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 I, and I quit smoking pot, but now I drink a lot. Or, or I mean, just, just back and forth. I'm, my, I, I, I love my wife and I love my husband, but I hate my stinking job. I despise going there every single day. Urgh. Or you can choose, sorry, you could choose to serve the Lord in your work. Like, as unto the Lord. <clears throat> Only then will you prosper. Only when. Only when. Look at verse 7. Only... Only then will you be able to have this life of prosperity where it's good just straight across the board. Verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Now, hold on a second. Look up here. The Bible, there's no mistakes in the Bible. There's no typos. There's no God going, oops, I wish I had some white out. He just said a moment ago, be strong and courageous. Did you read that? But what did he say just now? Be strong and what? Very courageous. Don't just blow by stuff like that. That's a treat. That's a golden nugget for you. Why? Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. 
Study this book of instruction right here. You guys all said you loved your Bible, right? Okay. Study the book of instruction. Here it is, right here, right? God gave it to you. You can get one on your phone for free. For free. I watched bedtime stories again today. For free. You can get it for free. And he says right here, <clears throat> don't take it for granted. That's me saying that. He says, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything in it. Now this is the part for you. Only then, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. So a couple things here. When you're charging a mountain and you got fear and, and danger and hurt, right? And you charge it anyway, you have to be strong and you got to be courageous because that's scary and dangerous and all that. I got it. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. But what he's saying here is that you have to not only be strong, but you have to be very courageous to obey the Bible. So, so, so. So he's saying, listen, Joshua, do me a favor. Look out over there. See the river, and it's gushing over the edge, and you could drown. And look even beyond that. There's an army, a wall of killers waiting to murder you. You need to be strong and courageous to face that. Who would agree? But he's saying you need to be even more courageous to follow this book. See, I watched Theo's sermon. And what did he tell you? He's going to ask you to do things you don't want to do. And I'm here to repeat that, echo what he said. God's going to ask you to do things you don't want to do that are more scary than that big old army over there. And so he says you need to be very, very courageous. He's going to ask you to do, let me ask you a question. Listen, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, but I'm not going to follow it up with the question you think I'm going to. Okay, seriously. How many people in here, have, in their adult life, felt God tug on them and say, I want you to either give your entire paycheck away or your entire bank account, give it to my cause. Raise your hand. I felt it. Oh, I felt it big time. And I have to tell you right now, complete coward. I mean, if we're going to be honest, if I'm going to make you be honest, I've got to be honest. I've had time, I've probably had three times in my life where God has pressed me and said, Moses, I want you to empty your bank account into that machine. I mean, I, I could sit here and say, hey, look at me, I'm holy. You guys should be like me. I do it. I don't. I've been afraid. But some of us in the room have felt that way. Some of us have felt that way. That's not normal, is it? <laughs> Again, having to do that. How many people have, 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 had that, have had God tell them, you need to go apologize to that person even though they're a complete butthole and they were wrong and terrible and I hate them and, you, and, and God says, you gotta, go, you gotta go make it right right now. How many people? Come on, right? Yeah, yeah. He's gonna ask you to do things you don't wanna do. How many people, how, many, how about it, going to vol I talked about earlier, volunteering for the children's ministry. Like nobody wants to volunteer for the, for the children's ministry and so you hear people announce it and you're like, ah, I don't wanna do that. Because you know why? You know why you feel that? Because God's asking you to go do something that you don't wanna go do. How, how, many, how about singing out loud? People don't like to do that, right? I can't sing out loud. I, I'll step on someone's toes. I, I, I'll be too loud. All attention to me. Jesus said that all authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. So if he says, sing out loud with your hands lifted high, who are you to say no? Right? Come on. He says to do it. So he's going to ask you to do things you don't want to do. How about forgive the one who touched you the wrong way? Yeah. How about giving an allowance for fault? How about pray for your enemy? These are things that you don't want to do. And so you're going to need to be very courageous because apologizing and forgiving someone who did something very horrible to you is very difficult, very painful, but you've got to stand under it and trust God's with you, and I'm going to get through this. Got to. So across the, 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 the board, biblical God-given prosperity occurs one way. Just one, there's no, there's no other way. You might think you have a way, you don't have a way. And you might think you have a way, but you don't have a way. Nobody has a way. You think you have a way, you don't have a way. There's only one way. There's only one way, and it's God's way, and it's Yahweh. I've been waiting all week to say that. 
Look at verse 7 and 8. Again, I'm going to read it because it's important. God's word's amazing. It says right here, it says, be strong, very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book. Study this book of instruction continually, continually. Listen, everyone in this room, you can't just read every now and again, maybe on Christmas. You read it continually. Listen, and you're not doing God any favors. He's still God if you don't read the Bible. But if you want to prosper in all that you do, it says that you will read it continually. You will meditate on it day and night. Only then, only then, Will you prosper and succeed in all that you do? So I would venture to say that in this room, we're, we're with people that are all different stages of life. Some people are, are rocking it on all eight cylinders. Everything's going great. And some of us, maybe we're on uh, limp home mode. And, and the reason that you're on limp home mode might just be this. So maybe that's your word for the night. Maybe it's just that you are not continually reading God's book of instruction and you're not meditating on it day and night because the God that you say you believe, who you said you want to follow, you have to make a choice to do what he says. And he says if you meditate on his word day and night, then and only then will you prosper in all that you do. Similar verbiage and then we're going to be done. Over in Psalm chapter 1, the first psalm, the very first psalm, look what it says. Must be something to it. The psalmist says this. Man, he must have known something. He must have known Joshua. Or maybe he had the same God. Maybe it's the same spirit speaking to these people. Oh, the joys. Who wants joy here? Anyone? I don't think you do. Come on now. Oh, the joys of those who do not. So he starts up with the, ones, the, what the things you shouldn't do. If you want to be rocking on all cylinders, is it, is it the joys of those who, who follow the advice of the wicked? No. He says the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked uh, or stand around with sinners, like, like what they do, I do, monkey see, monkey do kind of thing there, right? Uh, or join in with mockers, the, the ones who like make fun of us because we're Christians and we're weak-minded and we need a crutch. Someone agree with me, I do need a crutch. Anyone? I need a crutch. I need a crutch. Here, look at, so those aren't the people who have joy. Look at the people who have joy. Verse 2, the people who have joy delight in the law of the Lord. Oh, and look at this. Meditating on it day and night. That's what, that's what Joshua, that's what God just said to Joshua, right? If you want prosperity in all that you do, you, you meditate on God's word. That's the secret recipe. There it is. That's for you. Look what it says. They, those people that do that, they are like trees planted along the riverbank. They're not starving for, 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 for nutrients. They're not blown over with every wind of different type of gospel and every different type of doctrine and every modern day hype that people want to believe and things don't go good. My bank account's down. My life is over. No, they're like trees planted along the riverbank, deeply rooted, right? Bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither. And look at this. They prosper in all that they do. And that is the type of prosperity that God wants for you. Across the board prosperity in all things. Success in all things. Peace in all things. Joy in all things. Not just having something good at home, but something at work is jacked up. Jacked up vocation, good thing at home terrible job but we make lots of money good job but we're totally broke uh, great relationships at work but our relationship at church is terrible we have no friends like he wants across the board prosperity and this is the point where you have to choose this is the point where you have to choose listen here listen before you go this is the point where you have to choose 
Do you want to be prosperous in all that you do? My friend Dan, I don't even know where he's up here, and if I misquote this, please help me. He tells me that when an addict finally quits, it's when the pain of continuing to do this exceeds the pain of fixing it. That's when they quit. And, and that's exactly what God's telling you all right now. If your life is not rocking on all eight cylinders, this is why. You have to choose to meditate on His Word day and night. So this is what we're going to do. I want to pray with you. And then when I say amen, they're going to hand out communion. I want you to hold on to it. And in those moments of quiet, I want you to make some choices. And, and, and forget what I want. I think God wants you to make some choices. Remember Joshua said, choose today whom you will serve. See, the Bible, what the Bible is telling you here now is if, if you want prosperity in all areas across the board of your life, this is how you're going to get it. Only then. Let's pray and then we'll receive the communion elements. Father, thank you for bringing me back to this beloved family of faith. I thank you, Lord, that we are standing in your miracle. I thank you, Lord, that we are witnesses to the promise that you will build your church. And I thank you, Lord, that this can be a church that is being built on the word of God. Lord, you have placed before us blessings and curses, death and life. And your word says, with a plea from your heart, oh, that you would choose life. Lord, there are so many people, not just in this room, but beyond, that are so hurting. There are people in this room that do not enjoy biblical prosperity of shalom, of peace and joy and prosperity in all things and that's what you want for us and you have been so kind to lay before us how to do it how to get there help us now by the power of your spirit help us to crave the word of God to study your book of instruction continually to no longer make excuse of I'm too busy and such but to realize the treasure that is God's word that if we will choose to study it continually that we will choose to meditate on it day and night to consider this Jesus to fix our eyes on this Jesus that you will bring bring biblical prosperity, shalom, into our lives. So now is the time to choose.